Um, I was uh, listening to the radio uh, a week or so ago, and uh, they had kind of a tribute on there to Will Rogers. And uh, some of his quotes, I've always enjoyed his various euphemisms. And um, one they were mentioning was, uh, be thankful that we're not getting all the government we paid for. <laughs> I certainly see that in me. Right? Uh, another one was, uh, I belong to no organized party. I'm a Democrat. <laughs> And the last one that I'll read is, uh, good decisions come from knowledge. Knowledge is learned from bad decisions. <laughs> so those of us that have been in agriculture long enough, like our speakers today, have certainly learned from our mistakes. And the great thing about a conference like this is that folks like Jack and Ann can come and share their years of experience and hopefully help others not to go down the road of those mistakes that they learned over the years. Jack and Ann started in the 70s, 1976, uh, on their farm, originally 60 acres, began processing milk in 1979, and early on realized that taking care of their land was their best investment. <coughs> In 05, they installed a 35 kW wind turbine, which supplies 40% of the electricity on the farm. And the farm, over the years, has grown to 400 acres, half of which is in hay and half in grain. They have a 100 head Jersey herd that supplies their Butterworks farm um, yogurt, um, yogurt business. In 1999, they were awarded the Vermont Sustainable Farm of the Year, and in 2010, Jack was presented with the NOFA Person of the Year Award. And Jack and Ann are recognized across the country as national leaders in the organic movement and generously agreed to share their knowledge with us today. So, introduce Jack and Ann. Thank you, everybody, and um, I think we're going to get up here, we're going to sort of tell our story, and the first thing I'd like to say is that we have a special connection with Maine, um, and spent all our summers on Mount Desert, and uh, the family place is still there, uh, Dave and Sheila, who are sitting here in the front, Dave Zan's cousin, and they, they live there, and they're on MDI, and participate in some of the good local food that's being produced there. And uh, so every summer for about the last 35 or 40 years, we sort of made the trek from northern Vermont across across Maine, and we've gone many different ways, you know. This time we um, went towards Augusta and then crossed, you know, down to West Paris and, you know, done. And every, every summer um, when I'm sort of with the family you know, at the ocean, I just have to go get like a little dose of our agriculture. So I, every year I would always just at least take one day trip and drive to Albion or Brooks or Monroe or wherever, Whitefield, and go visit somebody that maybe Russell Libby had told me about. Or So it's been really, it's so cool to see what's going on here. And I think the same thing is going on in Vermont with, you know, a, a local farming community that uh, supports each other, and uh, you've got lots of great local products. And there's been a few dairies here that we've helped uh, you know, get started in, in their little food businesses, and uh, so and things keep keep changing. And uh, so our story is that you know we started um, <coughs> as sort of. Homesteaders, back to the landers. Um, you know, I, w I went to Tufts in Boston, and kind of this was in the '70s and late '60s, early '70s, and kind of got the got the alternative lifestyle bug. You know, I, I uh, didn't really sort of feel that comfortable, you know, in the political demonstrations of the time. I mean, I did take part in them, and when they shut down the schools, I was certainly there out there marching, but. There was just something about 
um, you know, growing my own food. And I did, I did grow up, and I grew up uh, sort of on the Connecticut, Massachusetts border near near Springfield, Massachusetts. My father worked for none other than Monsanto Chemical Company, which is so interesting. And um, <laughs> they were, uh, you know, a at the time they were a plastics company. And that's what my dad did. He was a polymer chemist, you know, so he was a research chemist and, you know, helped develop polyethylene, but he was a big gardener and, uh, you know, he baked all his own bread and, you know, made his own sauerkraut and pickled his own pig's feet and used to buy big buckets of herring and pickle his own herring and so I, and I always helped my dad in the garden and then I'd, I would go up and down the street where we lived with a little wagon that was his wagon when he was a kid and sell the extra vegetables. So I think that was sort of the beginning of my uh, sort of desire to go back to the land. So while while I was at Tufts, I I, I just just I just I wanted to figure out, you know, how, how uh, you know how how could I go back to the land or how and, and certainly in a school like that there's there's no there's no courses in, in agriculture at all. So I ended up they let you create your own major and I created my own major in the history of agriculture. And, uh, and then, I, then I started reading about how the colonists, early colonists farmed, and that sort of led to a job at Old Sturbridge Village on the farm there, which is right here where I grew up. And uh, I met Anne at Old Sturbridge Village, and she just happened to be you know, out in Wisconsin. And you know, I'd been sort of working on some farms in Vermont at the time, in 1973. And uh, then I went out to Wisconsin with her, and we, well, let's just show it pictures anyway. So we, so we, we went to Wisconsin together. We, Anne was at UW-Madison and uh, studying anthropology and some animal science. And uh, we got a place you know, outside of Madison, about 10, 15 miles, to get to know a local farmer. And it was sort of the end of the old sort of mixed farming era in the Midwest where farms had pigs and cows and chickens and, you know, little granaries and you know, they hadn't really specialized and corn and soybeans had not become a rampant disease yet and uh, so we had a, a farmer friend named John Ace who was our mentor and I think for us over the years it's all about the people that we met and the people who influenced us and the people we learned from and it's, it's been it's just been a, a great time we'll just tell you sort of how it went and and what it got to, what it got to and and what the disadvantages of you know, the scale that we've sort of achieved, which now, in retrospect, is probably not serving us that well. But, so um, we, um, we moved back. I, I was in Vermont in 1973, and, and then I you know, went to, back to Massachusetts and out to Wisconsin, and we stayed there for a year, and we um, you know, bought a bunch of stuff. You know, we bought a, you know, we'd go to all these old farm auctions and buy, uh, a hammer mill and a cook stove and a rototiller and a bunch of harnesses and we were we were gonna be you know back to the landers and we got we had so much stuff we had to buy this 1937 Chevrolet truck to uh, to get it back here it took us four four days to get from uh, Wisconsin to, to northern Vermont and uh, had a little homestead that we moved to and we'd been there about a week and got a job at a furniture factory and didn't really like it very much, and, but met somebody at the furniture factory that had a cow they wanted to sell, so we bought their cow, <coughs> which was a, mostly Jersey, but I'm sure she was a cross. And uh, that's probably you know where our herd started. Her name was Pet, and oh my God, she was hard to milk. She you know we, we got really strong hands. Remember, remember those uh, really small orifices in her tits. <laughs> And so, uh, you know, so we started, and uh, you know, we got a calf to raise for beef, and um, you know, started accumulating equipment, you know, $25 manure spreaders, and, you know, an old farm, uh, an old uh, Ford 9N tractor, and, you know, we were, and, and got a job uh, uh, delivering and dairy product, I mean, dairy uh, supplies to dairy farmers, and it's so interesting, you know, because at that time, in 1975, there were still a lot of small farms left, and and farming was pretty viable in the late 70s. Still, I mean, people were it was prosperous. There were prosperous times on dairy farms at that time. Um, and as time went on, we built a house. And we both got better jobs. I got a job teaching school at the local high school, at special ed, and Anne was working at the mental health center. And 
we were able to, you know, everything back then we were able to pretty much do everything from our from our teaching salaries. So you know, we built our house, you know, from our teaching salaries, and we were, you know, growing a garden. And you know, by that time, you know, there we were, like the young couple, <laughs> a lot lighter in weight, you know, with a lot less facial hair, but uh, and uh, you know, it was that's Lake Willoughby underneath us there, which is uh, one of those beautiful sort of mountain lakes in northern Vermont that looks like a fjord. And, um, you know, we had a workhorse, of course, and, you know, and we made so many mistakes. I mean, the workhorse we bought was, you know, was foundered, you know, so we had to give him aspirin every day if we wanted to work him. And, uh, but he taught us, he knew more than we did, for sure. And, uh, but we had to, you know, get our milk up to the road, and we had a little sort of a three-beam sled with shafts on it, and we actually worked that horse quite a bit, and, um, and then we had a daughter in 1979, her name is Christine, and uh, she's still there, and she's, she's married now, and we've got uh, two, two girls, age 10 and 8, and uh, she's part of, uh, she's the next generation that's, uh, that's coming along to uh, uh, you know, take our farm over, and, uh, which we'll get into that a little later, and uh, these are just some sort of pictures of some of the you know early times and uh, and we had we ended up with a team of Belgians and um, you know did some work with them um, turned out I found out very quickly that every time I put the harness on the horse I'd start sneezing and my eyes would start itching and my nose would start running and I realized that um, you know that horses were probably not going to be for, for me and, uh, but, uh, so we had small old tractors, you know, little John Deere 40s, and that was a $25 grain drill right there. And, uh, you know, one of the things that we wanted to do when we first started was we really wanted to grow our own grain for our own bread. And we'd spent some time in, when we were in southern Wisconsin, and we saw how the Amish did it with, with grain binders and threshing machines. And, and, and that's sort of like everything I wanted to do, we had to do the old-fashioned way first. And I think it's because we didn't really grow up with it, but we were going to try it, and once we tried it, we'd do it for a you know a few years, or maybe even five or ten years. But eventually, we we sort of got more modern. But it's almost like we had to go through the progression of agricultural mechanical history ourselves just to just to experience it. So, uh, so we did get a, a very shortly after moving there, um, we did get a grain binder, and one of the interesting things was that you know sort of. You talk to all the old timers, and grain growing was pretty much, you know, had stopped at least 10 or 15, 20 years earlier because there'd been a, a couple of wet, wet summers in the 60s, and um, <clears throat> people couldn't get their oats. And they, so after that, people started cutting their oats for hay and not, you know, having them for grain. But um, one thing that we discovered is that we lived 10 miles from the border with Quebec. And we would go to Sherbrooke once in a while that first summer for um, for Chinese food, or just, just to go to the big city, which was Sherbrooke, Quebec. And um, and on the way there, which is about 30 miles to Sherbrooke, they, we we just walk out these grain fields, and there'd be all these combines in there out there, and, and it was only 20, 30 miles from home, and it was just a, a totally different culture that you know it was dairy farming, but there was also grain being grown. And it was very similar to the way it was in Wisconsin, where People were growing ear corn and uh, and oats for their for their for their cows and taking it to the mill. So we said, well, if they can do it in Quebec, we can do it here. And if they used to do it here, so we we went to Quebec and we bought you know the grain binder and the threshing machine for 125 dollars a piece. I think it was. And we uh, you know that first year we grew a crop of wheat and uh, you know and then we had good beginners luck. You know we reaped it and stooped it and uh, and then you know it, we set up we got this big tin threshing machine and uh, set that up and it, it sort of gave us credibility with the locals because uh, you know people came from miles around to see this stuff because you know they were in their 50s and 60s and the last time they'd seen it when they were about 20 years old or something and they'd tell you all the stories about man you'd never want to barley was the worst because we would get really really itchy from all those little barbs on it and so people remembered and um, you know we uh, we'd set it up and we, we ended up, they always told us that you got the very best grain from doing it this way because I had a chance to really cure in the field and you got really nice color and, you know, I have to say that we're right. You can see there we're using burlap bags to store it and, you know, I think we, 
it might have been a little on the moist side, we don't really know, but at least it breathed in the burlap bag. So a lot of it was just kind of beginner's luck for us. Um, as time went on, you know, we had, we had a lot of apprentices in the beginning. And um, we, this is a little doc drawing that our daughter did probably when she was about eight or so. And uh, <laughs> they're pretty, pretty accurate character, <laughs> characters there, you know. And uh, so I'm just that picture there. And one of them, that's Gerard right there in the center holding a rock. And he's, a, he's from France and he's, a, he's actually married a girl in our community. And uh, they have a vegetable farm now called Berry Creek and they're very successful market gardeners and CSA people. Um, go back to Gerard, right? You can see Gerard there in the center. <laughs> <laughs> She's a good artist. Christine's a good artist. Was a good artist, wasn't she? <laughs> and, um, and so we, we live, we have this, we bought this piece of land that was, you know, that was a big, a kind of a, a glacial cave is what it was. It's very, very nice loam soil, but just loaded with rocks. And uh, so we, we pick stones a lot, a lot. And, I, for some reason, I just wanted to get the rocks picked, and you know, we started out with six acres of grain, and we had six acres for you know probably five or six years, and then we kind of went from six to ten, and ten to fifteen, and fifteen to twenty, as you know, we got better and better machinery. But um, I, I didn't like picking stones, but I was willing to do it, and I think it was one of the things that. And really did not care for it. <laughs> I have no patience for picking stones. I have many more things that seem more important to me. <laughs> but you have to do it. <laughs> so, um, and as time went on, I mean, in the beginning, all we could really afford for equipment was everybody else's cast offs. And of course, that, that was sort of a recipe for disaster and for a recipe for breakdowns. And so, um, as time went on, you know, we, we ended up, we started, you know, we started out with. Um, a couple of cows, and then a couple of cows came came four because you know we had some really good friends, Marge and Daryl Buck, who um, were you know people that we were sort of our mentors, <clears throat> and we didn't really know anything about what we were doing. I mean, I'd read a ton of old books, you know, talking to Phoenix O'Brien here last night. I mean, we probably have very similar libraries of all these old agricultural books from the early early 1900s, and you, know, you can read about a lot of stuff, but when you got a cow that's out in the field with no fever and all you know laying down, can't get up, you know, and you don't know what to do, and, and then, you know, a friend stops by, and, you know, they could go over in the farm, and you get a used needle, and a, somebody's IV set, and you give the cow an IV of calcium, and boom, she comes back to life, and, you know, the, it, 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 you know it was like the first time it happened, we didn't know what, what it was, you know, but, we were, but you know, it's like we just, uh, you know, kind of kept persevering, but uh, as far as the cows went, you know, our friend Daryl had a couple of cows he was going to beef, so we, we, we bought his cast off cows for beef price. And you know, one's name was number six, and the other one was Graham. And they were Graham was a bony old thing. And, uh, and, and we got a pile of calves, and we this was 1979 by this time. And uh, we built our house, and we had a little, little sort of barn that we built on the side, and had little wooden stanchions with a wooden floor, and all the things that we thought we should have because that's how the old timers did it. And um, we, we raised, raised up a bunch of calves. We both left our jobs by that time in 1979. We had a, a young child who I mean, was born in July of that year. And um, raised up these calves. And then all of a sudden, uh, the calves got to be 30 day, 90 days old. And we weaned them. And our milk supply about quadrupled. And so we'd been making some yogurt in, you know, in glass jars and selling it to a couple of neighbors earlier. but. We started making a lot of dairy products on our kitchen stove. And we got this book called Making Your Own Cheese and Yogurt by Max Alf, which if, it, if you, it's the greatest little book for people who don't really have a science background, but you know, kind of want to learn about how to process milk in a fairly kind of professional way. And uh, so we were using a lot of like blue enamel and white enamel pots with double boilers, you know, on our wood cook stove. And, um, making farmer's cheese and yogurt and went in butter and we had a wooden barrel butter churn you know, just like you did in the old days and we were just about your cats meow or something you know and, uh, <laughs> but um, one day I, we had all these products that we'd been making so we got in, I got in my car it was my you know we had, got our parents cast off cars at the time and you know, that my parents had given me their I don't know, what's a 1965 Ford Galaxy 500, you know, and 
put on, we put on the, we ended up taking the back seat out of that one, you know, so we could put hay bales and things in it. <laughs> they were like scratching their heads the whole time. But uh, we, um, I got in the car and I had butter, I had cottage cheese, farmer's cheese, some raw milk and Tropicana juice jars, um, yogurt, and we had, <clears throat> and we figured out that we could put maple syrup and milk and make a maple yogurt too. And uh, I just went outside and knocking on doors in the community. And um, I came back five hours later and there were no, we had no dairy products left. Everybody, they bought them. So that was the beginning of our dairy group. You know, that was 1979. And um, so we would kind of set it up we were earlier in the week. You know, we'd deliver it. Do you remember what they would deliver it to? Was it Wednesdays? And so what we would do was we would make this, the products that we could store you know, till the next Wednesday on Thursday and Friday, and then mix some stuff over the weekend. Got to the point where we ended up, there's a house next door that belonged to some Montrealers, and we would kind of have to borrow their refrigerator because we had the key to their house, and we'd kind of look, at, look after it during the week, when they came on the weekends, but, um, and then by, you know, Tuesday, we would, you know, bottle all the raw milk from that day, and maybe Wednesday morning in Tropicana juice jars. So we had raw milk, we had eggs, um, I don't know what else, you know, we'd have, we had butter, um, the butter was, you know, it was kind of old-fashioned butter that got, got kind of tangy after a while because it was, you know, just done in a wooden barrel churn. But the old-timers really liked the butter because it tasted like the butter they grew up with, you know. And um, so it all sold, and we did that for, oh, I don't know, two, three years, and, you know, we ended up starting, we started slipping into stores a little bit, you know, like, we had a friend who had a bakery, and, and she went, she went to, you know, the big co-op in Burlington and the co-op in Montpelier. And uh, so we started putting our dairy products, you know, on her truck. We'd cover them with a blanket, you know, to, you know, get them to the store. And she and that stuff sold really, really well. And um, so we said, no, we're going to do this. And, um, and it was just about that time, I think it was, was it 81 that the state came on? <laughs> and all of a sudden somebody knocked at our door one day and it was Stan Baker who actually ended up to be our milk inspector who was a really good guy actually and uh, he said you know you need a license to do this <laughs> so um, I said well, what do we need to do to get legal and uh, so they told us and it seemed kind of daunting at the time but um, we, we set about doing it and we uh, we decided we were going to build a barn, so the first thing we did was, <clears throat> you know, this whole farm that I'd worked on in Barnet, Vermont, they had a, um, a, a Paypec silo filler with a, a big flat belt, and, uh, you know, they picked up their, their green hay out in the field with a hay loader, and, and uh, so, of course, we had to make our silage that way, too, so we, we got this silo, we tore it down at a farm. The one thing we didn't... <clears throat> we failed to do was we failed to measure the diameter of the silo. <clears throat> so we, when it came time, I think it was a 14 foot silo and we built it 13 or something. I don't, I don't know what we were thinking, but you know, we poured the foundation, mixed cement with an old cement mixer and, you know, used old roofing tin to make the forms and, uh, you know, put it up like this and then we built the staging around it. And then one day a big old wind came down and blew it over and we had to start all over again. <clears throat> but, um, we had an apprentice from Canada who was our first, you know, long-term apprentice, Alex English. He stayed with us for a whole year, and he helped us do the silo. But right in the middle of putting the silo up, he got deported by the Border Patrol. So but then we got him back. We got him a visa, which, you know, and they were at the Border Patrol. So not happy about that. But uh, so we put the silo up, and then, as you can see, we have, we have the old farm all super M and the belt, the flat belt. And, you know, we shoveled the, There was the green hay in the old Chevy truck, and it, you know, they had to dump, but you had to like crank the handle to turn, you know, to, to dump it. And so we did all this stuff. And, you know, with it, by the next year, we hired the neighbor to come in with his chopper and, and it got it all done in a couple of hours. And it was, instead of being four days, it was four hours. And, uh, and we actually probably made much better silage too. And, uh, and then we also started building our, we built a barn because we, we had built our house about, um, you know, 500 feet from the road. And um, so, of course, when we built the barn, you know, we, we weren't going to go rent farms or anything because it was a kind of a complicated foundation with 12-foot walls with step-downs. So we built it all out of boards and two-by-sixes and, and number nine form wire. And, you know, 
that we, we didn't do too many more foundations like this, um, but it took all summer. You know, we built in two halves and uh, took the first half down and, you know, used it to build the second half. And, um, and <clears throat> but by 1982, our barn was built. And um, we, at the, at the time, you know, we processed milk right up to the summer of 82. And I remember we told all the stores that we'll be back in six months as soon as everything was done. We'll, we'll, we'll be back on the shelves. So it was, you know, it was two, two years before we were, were back, you know, on the, on the shelves in the stores. But that was, you know, it was a post of meat barn, and um, it was the beginning of our, so that was about 1982 that the frame went up. By in 1983, we had our stable done downstairs. By 84, we, you know, had our, 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 uh, our milk plant done upstairs. And then we had a, you know, a rather large crew of apprentices that summer, you know, making many, many small batches of yogurt on our kitchen stove, burning, burning ourselves and everybody else out. And, um, there's the barn, you know, we started sheathing it ourselves. We we did have a, a timber framer help us put the frame up and then we pretty much did everything else ourselves, you know, putting all the boards on and the roof and all that stuff. And there it is right there, you know, like that would have been in the beginning. We ended up putting a high drive on the front. Um, you know, we didn't have a, you know, we had just a, you know, our strong backs and our weak lines to do the you know, cleaning every day. One thing we found out though is that when we dumped our manure out every day, since we used all our straw in the manure, that it was totally different than everybody else's manure around us. Because it, we have it in these long piles of where they're kind of like loaves of bread almost. And um, they would heat all through the winter, even though it was 30 below zero out, the, the pile would be cooking. So we realized that, you know, we've, we sort of just discovered compost by accident. And, um, and so we knew that this is kind of the direction that we wanted to go. And, uh, and our herd started growing. There's our, our, actually, that's just our, our first herd of four there. And then the, you know, cows started having calves, and calves started reproducing. Um, during this time, there was a, a fellow that we met whose name was Fred Franklin, who was a local sort of soils guru. And he was kind of an interesting guy. He was basically, you know, had studied under this guy, this, this agronomist in New York State named Norman Curtis, who was a student of William Albrecht. So he was very into the cation exchange capacity type. And I, this is where I really started learning about soils, is from Fred Franklin. And I, I, I started subscribing to Acres USA and realizing that there was another publication besides organic gardening that we could get some information from. And there were farms out in the Midwest and places that were actually doing, you know, what they called eco-agriculture on a much larger scale, you know, using some interesting sort of, you know, seaweed and all kinds of stuff. I, hadn't really heard of. So, so it started broadening my mind. But the one thing we realized at the time is that we really didn't have the money to be able to really put a lot of minerals on our land. We knew we needed to, and we were able to, use, to, to get small amounts of things like salt ball mag and, and rock phosphate. But it wasn't until you know, we got our dairy license in 1984 that we started having enough income to really uh, put some, some, to add some mineral, mineral fertility to our land, and, and we'll go on to talk about that. So there's, you know, the herd started growing over the years. Um, you know, we got our license, we started selling, and instead of going door to door, we started going store to store. The only thing was in the very beginning that we were, we, we got onto the market in 1984. We had been there earlier, but in the absence of us being on the market, you know, this little outfit in New Hampshire called Stonyfield Farm had started producing yogurt. And I remember talking with Samuel Kamen back in, was 83 or something, and he was saying, well, you know, you can be in Vermont, and I'll be in New Hampshire, and well, that didn't really work, and he was all over Vermont, because, you know, NEFCO, or Northeast Co-ops, was distributing his stuff to all the co-ops, and so I would go to a co-op, and, you know, we'd have our, our yogurt, and, and uh, we really don't need your yogurt, we already have a, a little farm yogurt, and, uh, can you just put it in here anyway, please? You know? <laughs> and which they would do. And, and so, but we were making some farmer's cheese and cottage cheese also at the time. So we were, you know, we were at least adaptable enough to know how to make some different types of dairy products. And we, there was something that we could sell. But eventually, within, a, within six months to a year, the other thing is we started in October of 84. And the fall is traditionally a time when people are really, you know, they're, they're eating beans and meat and, and grains and, you know, kind of stocking up on heavier foods and not eating yogurt, you know. Um, and I remember the guy at the Hanover Co-op in New Hampshire, where it was one of our early accounts, would tell us that, well, you just wait till January, 
after Christmas, everybody's going to go on a diet, and they're going to uh, you know, eat lots of yogurt. And he was right, at least back then. <laughs> and um, so, you know, we started out by, you know, we had, you know, very high-fat jersey milk, but we would take our jersey milk apart, and we would, you know, make butter out of the cream, and that's our name, and, uh, and make a skin milk yogurt. And for, I'd say for the first 20 years, that's probably what people wanted. And as time has gone on, people have been eating yogurt, they want more and more fat. But, um, so this is some of their our early, uh, you know, like, we didn't, we, we weren't marketers or anything, but we were really like, you know, in Stan's drawing right here, and, you know, you can see all the different things, you know, the little cows and their stanchions and the little surge milkers, and, you know, we were milking with cans at the time, and uh, hauling cans up the stairs, and we had a little wood-fired sort of steam teapot boiler over there on, on the right, and, uh, you know, there's, our yogurt room was upstairs, and, the, the original idea was to put, you know, our little mill and granary right in the upstairs of our barn, but that ended up changing as time went on. But uh, this is our early cow stable here, which is, uh, you know, one thing we really, what, that we wanted to do in our barn, that, you know, we had been in a lot of barns, so we wanted to make sure we had a really nice high ceiling, and that we had a lot of uh, south light in our barn, you know, so that it wasn't a dank, dark stable. And so, I mean, we didn't know a lot of things, I mean, we didn't really, when we built our barn, we, we didn't really set it up with efficiency in mind because, you know, we hadn't really grown up on dairy farms and, you know, of experienced dairy farmers would come and scratch their heads while we built our cows in an L shape instead of in an O shape, you know, so we could put a, you know, gutter cleaner in there. But we, uh, we did what we wanted to do. We, we had a can cooler and we had, this was a deluxe can cooler with had, had doors on the front and a sump pump that sprayed the cans with ice water and of course we used you know, just regular old, I mean, I still have all these milk cans, you know, but we had to switch to stainless ones after a while. But, you know, you could buy a nice milk can, you need to look inside, if it wasn't rusty, you'd buy 10 bucks, you know. And uh, this was our early, you know, everything that we got in the early days, still, I mean, we just, we got everybody else's cast offs. This little vat down the bottom was uh, was $100, the boiler was $100, and, you know, needed, everything needed tons of work. But, uh, you know, there had been lots of old little dairies around that had, you know, bottled milk and sold it in their communities, and there was a lot of this stuff around at the time. There's a lot less around of it right now, and pretty much a lot of it's gone to South America or been grabbed by dealers. But um, you know, we uh, we had a you can see down there in the bottom on the corner, we had a you know a bowl top separator that we uh, you know used to you know make our separate our milk. And uh, but as time went on, we you know started kind of getting you know more money, and you know one of the first things I did was you know at least buy part of a train car load of rock phosphate. You know, and as you can see, the stuff kind of flowed like water. We couldn't catch it when we, when we dumped it out of the truck. But uh, And what ended up happening, as soon as we started applying minerals to our land, the legumes started increasing, um, you know, the yield started increasing, and the cows started getting healthier with less problems. Um, it was just like day and night. And, uh, and so this sort of became the sort of the be all and end all for me was that it, you, you're not going to be able to grow good crops, you know, without minerals. And and so I kind of learned a lot over the years about how to take care of soils. And um, you can't put on the inputs if you don't have the the cash to buy the rock phosphate. But most of the time, see, it seems what happens is when you when you're first starting out and you buy a farm or you buy some land. You know, the people who were there before you exploited the land because the economic system that we live in forces people to not put anything back. And so you take and you take and you take to the point where it gets really, really run down and really acid and really unproductive. And if whatever hay you do grow, you know, is not really going to nurture your animals. So, um, but as time went on, you know, we, we would... Um, go from, uh, you know, like Timothy Clover, and I started planting some alfalfa, and believe it or not, the alfalfa started thriving on our farm. So, I, you know, this is what you, what minerals can do for you. It, it, they really, um, you know, they'll make some really nice feed for you. And uh, and also what ended up happening is the biodiversity of, of plants in our pastures, you know, started increasing. And for the whole, the whole time, it was just like, you know, there was so much, so many grass, you're the same here in Maine, there's so many great things going on. I mean, with people, you know, discovering new things about how to, you know, how to farm better 
you know, on a smaller scale. One of the things in Vermont, we had, you know, you've all heard of Bill Murphy, you know, who wrote the book Greener Pastures on Your Side of the Fence. He was a UVM professor, you know, who had started out as a corn and soybean guy and gone to, you know, like rotational grazing. So we had a big rotational grazing program in Vermont where farms could sign up and they would come and they'd tell you how to lay out paddocks and put in water systems. And so, you know, we were sort of part of that wave in the late 80s and early 90s, which kind of led to the whole organic dairy movement. And, um, but, um, you know, I guess one of the things we've, in the very beginning, we didn't really know, we knew that we didn't want to use chemicals and, and antibiotics and stuff, but we ended up having to sort of, um, you know, figure it out for ourselves. And, um, you know, all our, our mentors couldn't believe that we really want to just get a shop, you know. Well, we don't really want to do that. So we, we got into like some, what was it called? Um, ID1 or something? Remember that stuff? It was like colostral immunology, you know, where you use colostrum whey, you know, infused whey to, uh, you know, work on udders and, you know, different types of minerals. And, and then, you know, Anne started learning about, uh, you can talk about your homeopathy a little bit. <coughs> <laughs> I guess, you know, there wasn't any organic certification for organic dairy when, when we were first starting out. So we were just learning by the seat of our pants, choosing not to use antibiotics and trying to find other answers to the same old questions. So uh, we, we did use this colostrum whey byproduct and then we also found that there was a veterinarian from Pennsylvania who came to speak for the organic farmers and um, Ed Schaefer, maybe some of you are still familiar, he's still sort of practicing. Um, and he gave a presentation that a lot of us took really seriously. There were some people who walked away and said, oh, he's just, you know, blowing smoke. But um, he kind of started me on a new path that I learned a lot from him and then continued on with lots of workshops and we have a study group that's been going for 30 years of other interested people who get together twice a month and, and uh, look at homeopathy and try and learn more and more to be able to use it effectively for our animals and ourselves. So it's been, it's been a great path and I found over the years that it has great potential and is also supplemented with um, good nutrition and good um, vitamins and minerals are really helpful if you know you have deficiencies there. So for the cows, we often would treat them with homeopathy, but also with probiotics, like some of the products from Impro or um, Agrodynamics. Some of I think there's a Synergy product that's out there that's also herbal, and you, there are lots of possibilities to work with, and the more we tried the more options we found to, to keep the cows healthy and um, use them on our family as well. So um, it's just sort of we started. This is the sort of the beginning of building our farm organism, and um, I think what what. I don't know, how much how much time do we have left so that we can make sure that we cover the end too? You know, because it doesn't look like they've. Um... What time? Is it? Kela, Kela. Fifteen minutes. Okay, so we'll have to move right along here because <laughs> I think the early days were like so much fun because. You know, we were just getting started, and I imagine a lot of you are sort of in that situation right now where you're just getting started on your farms, and you haven't learned about all the regulations that, you know, are going to, like, sort of constrict you over the years. So in the very beginning, you know, we didn't know about withholding or, or, or um, you know, it was all apprentice labor. We didn't know that apprentices were supposed to be paid. I don't even know if these laws were, the, these modern laws that we have now were in existence then. But, um, we were able to take all of our finances and direct them back into our farm. And then when we did our, our Schedule F taxes, we just wrote everything off as farm expense. So we, didn't, so we were making a good living, 
We made, we made you know, some pretty good profits, and we bought equipment, we bought fertilizer, we built fencing, and um, you know, we didn't have to give any of it to the government. And uh, now we're going to give it all to the government. You know, it's like, it's just, um, yeah, it, it's insurance companies, you know, and um, but anyway, so this is what's going to happen if once you start to grow and get to this larger scale that, you know, everybody thinks it's because our society is organized with, on money. Everything's about budgets, and about business plans. Business plans? What you, what's a business plan? You know, you know, we just farmed with our heart, you know, and, and, and it worked by the seat of our pants, and it worked. But as time went on, um, I, I sort of had, you know, I had the inklings of iron fever in the beginning, and as time went on, you know, I got, you know, better tractors, and I mean, we, 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 got, we, we went from the 50s to the 60s, but, you know, they were still older tractors, but they were bigger and better to me, and, you know, so, you know, we opened up more land, this is our own farm, I mean, it's, uh, we bought the farm next door, you know, for, still for $400 an acre, you know, land was, this was in the 80s, and, um, you know, we, we just, you know, got a bigger grain drill, got a bigger tractor, you know, um, you know, started growing more, more different crops, uh, you know, got, you know, plows and harrows, and then I started going a little bit farther away from our farm, like a mile away, we got a, a field that we started using and kind of brought that one back to life, and then, and, there were, and then in 1990, I decided to start growing a little bit of corn in my grain rotation, because up till then, it was just pretty much oats, wheat, and barley, and then I started growing some soybeans, and then I got, you know, just, and just, it just kind of, started rolling like a big snowball down a hill, you know, getting bigger and bigger, and, you know, more and more equipment, and, uh, you know, I moved down into the valley, you know, stopped, stopped plowing on our farm, and because of, you know, and, and started working with more alluvial soils along the river. It turned out that near the river, especially this, about 10 miles away, it was 800 feet lower in elevation. We could grow longer season crops. We could actually harvest corn and soybeans for grain pretty reliably. And uh, you know, started getting old grain dryers, and I mean, got, there's a bunch more pictures. I don't think we're going to have time to see them, but um, you know, we started growing. You know, wheat. I ended up getting a, a self-propelled combine. This is my first one, and uh, and it just seemed like wherever you used a lot of compost, you know, you got really, really nice crops. So this, you know, this wheat here had been fertilized with, with uh, compost the fall before, and uh, plowed down. And, you know, it was a beautiful crop, and uh, you know, got a seed cleaner, and uh, uh, you know, flour mill, and um, then we stepped from there to a, a bigger combine. I think this is the one we still have today. It's a it's a 1988, and um, you know, it it's all we'll ever need, and we just keep keep fixing this one. But you know, we started growing some pretty nice grain crops with hay underneath them. Uh, you know, we started growing some row crops and dry beans, and uh, and then I, you know, I, in the beginning I started out with hybrid corn and I wanted to, uh, I wanted to grow open pollinated corn, but I could not find a variety that would uh, yield reliably where we lived. I mean, I tried a lot of different things. Rob Johnston gave me one one year called Matheson Dent from Northern Michigan, <clears throat> which I, which just, it did not do well for me. We tried, we tried Wapsie Valley, we tried Krugs, but there's a, I have a, Met a friend a guy from I lives in North Dakota now named Frank Kutka, who is a uh, you know, plant breeder. He studied uh, you know genetics and corn breeding under Margaret Smith at Cornell, and Frank ended up putting these like six, five or six different like breeders lines together and just bred them all in one plot, really short season stuff from Guelph, Ontario, and came up with this corn named Early Riser, which some of you here grow in Maine, and uh, you know it's not quite as uh, high yielding as a hybrid. But it's, as you can see, it's got a really dark, you know, orangey texture to it. It's hard, hard corn, and it makes really good corn meal. And, uh, and, it, and it makes pretty good animal feed, too. And uh, so we started growing this, and we've been growing early riser for at least 10 years and saving seed. Um, you know, we've gotten into some soda sunflowers and oil seed pressing and dry beans. And, um, but as time went on, you know, our cows were in this, like, tie stall barn. We'd put them out for recess every day. And um, we wanted to have a bedding pack. So in 2001, we put up this big hoop barn. 
and started keeping our cows in the winter on this bedding pack and feeding them round bales on the bedding pack and then using the bedding pack for, for compost. So, um, you know, there's, we called it our solar barn and it's, since, since then it's been rebuilt once because the posts that we put in the ground all rotted off after 11 years of, you know, having, you know, manure against them all winter. And uh, so now we have a concrete foundation under the thing, which we should have done in the beginning, but here's one of the lessons that we've learned. Um, and, you know, we've, we've shoveled it out ourselves. We hired the neighbor to come in uh, with this excavator, and then we've, you know, made these windrows of compost. And um, we got this old compost turner from the inner vale in Burlington that was in the weeds and brought that back to life and started, you know, turning our compost. And, uh, you know, so, um, and, you know, we, had, we, had, we live on a really windy hilltop, and, uh, you know, we, we want to, I always wanted to have a wind turbine and, you know, we, we sort of went embarked on this adventure to get a wind turbine and bought this one, came off of Tehachapi Big Pass in California and it was a piece of junk and uh, ended up having to get some people from South Dakota to come in and, and work on it with us and get it, you know, so the $30,000 windmill became a $100,000 windmill and, um, you know, Jim Jeffords, our senator at the time, had some DOE money that where they would pay for half of a project like this, so thankfully, you know, they, they covered the 50,000 of, of the thing. And it's, you know, it's worked on and off, and, you know, it, it's, it's a big lightning rod up there, and we've had, you know, the, the blades have been hit by lightning several times, and then if you break one blade, you've got to get three new ones or three blades of the same weight. So it's been down for the last two years, and just about a month or so ago, a guy came out from South Dakota and finally got it, you know, put a new blade on and balanced them and got it working again. So we're, so we're making power with the wind again on our farm. Um, and uh, we built this granary, as you can see, and then in, in 2008 we put a, a tower on the center of it, and there's a big green elevator that goes up to the top of that tower, and uh, you know, we, so we have been able to set up this building with, with, with an elevator and overhead bins and, a, and, a, and an oat hauler upstairs, um, you know, so that we can um, you know, uh, haul our own oats and make our own oatmeal if we want. Um, and lots of great things have been happening, you know, over the years. One of the greatest things that's happened in Vermont is um, a local girl named Heather Darby, you know, who, who had gone away to college to become an agronomist, came back with her PhD and uh, became our, our UVM extension agronomist. And Heather's just this great gal who, you know, works with the organic and conventional farmers alike on all their issues and is really interested in grain growing and how to be a better grain grower. So we wrote a SARE grant together to uh, learn how to breed wheat and, you know, bring some heirloom varieties back into production, you know, in, in bulk and increase the seed and then cross some of the heirlooms with some more modern varieties. So we went out to Pullman, Washington, which is certainly doesn't look like Vermont. This is the Palouse right here, where they get about seven inches of rain a year and uh, learned how to make wheat crosses and um, came back home and started, you know, emasculating wheat, you know, that's, that means like making, uh, uh, pulling all the male flowers out of the wheat so that you can fertilize it with a pollen from another one. And, and, um, and Heather, of course, was really good at it. I, need, I needed triple magnification to do it, but she was, seemed to be able to, you know, really, you know, work with her tweezers. And, and, um, and this is our first little grain plot with all these heirlooms in it. And then we made some crosses too. And then we, uh, you've probably heard of Steve Jones out in Washington State. You know, we, we did a lot of work with him, and he was the one who taught us how to how to emasculate wheat. Um, and um, and over the years, I think you know we've had a mentor program, and uh, you know this is Yi you're over here, you know on the left hand side, who's an incredible dairy farmer who went and built a a, sol a solar barn in his own place. That's John Clark right there. Um, you know we've had lots of workshops at our place, and uh, you know lots of knowledge has been sort of passed back and forth between farmers. Um, it, it, this, these were some wheat plots that we had. Um, and, you know, the future of our farm is, you know, in our grandchildren and our, and our daughter and son-in-law who, who live right there and uh, we're taking over. And it's, I think that's kind of how we're going to end this, is to, to tell you, you know, sort of, I've got some other slideshows, but we don't really need to look at them because it would take too long to get them up. And it's all just, Equipment, you know, which is like, it's a disease for me. But, uh, <laughs> but I think what I'd like to say is that, in conclusion here, is that 
we are, you, if you're on a dairy farm, I think that's, I really think having cows on your land, you know, is, is, if you, if you take really good care and rotate pastures and don't overgraze and give the land a chance to rest and mineralize it, you know, basically the three principles of soil fertility are, you know, the chemical, the physical, and the biological. So you can start out with a chemical and actually balance the soil with minerals, and the biology and the soil structure will sort of eventually come along if you're kind. And um, so what I think we've learned is that, you know, if the generosity in every way of life, you know, but, you know we'll talk about the soil right here first, um, you can talk about employees, what, what, whatever you want to do, it doesn't really, it doesn't cost you. It actually pays you. And if you are good to the land, the land is going to be good to you, and it's going to, it's going to get you through, especially the hard times. So, you know, we, when you have cows, and the cows are reproducing well, and you've got to have a calf every year, and then you raise your heifer calves, but your older cows are still productive, you know, it just brings you wealth, because you're either going to build your herd, or you're going to sell some extra animals. And so we have always been able to sell animals and build our herd at the same time. So what started out with two cows and went to four and six to 12 to 25, I mean, you know, Dave said we, we, know we have 100 cows. We don't milk 100 cows, we milk 45, maybe 50 if, if and then Ann starts getting really grumpy when we've got five more cows that will fit in the stable. But, um, you know, we've got this sort of built-in sort of limit for the number of cows that we're going to milk. The marketplace doesn't work that way. The marketplace expands and contracts at various times of the year, so you're going to have to figure out how to balance your production. Thankfully, Organic Valley has been really good to us, and there's one, you know, there was a local chicken farm that we were able to get milk from for years if we needed a little extra. But I think, you know, we, we, we got bigger and bigger, and we became legal in 1984. And I think the minute we became legal, we just we just started going down a different road because we were basically starting to play by other people's rules. And you know that these rules are sort of put in place to protect public health, but they also forced us to sort of concentrate on one particular product, you know, which was yogurt. And so what happened, you know, we sort of rode the wave through the 80s and the early 90s because we were like one of the only ones. Farmstead yogurt producers, people found out pretty quickly that it wasn't really that hard to make. And, um, you know, now there's tons more yogurt on the shelf. And it's, you know, it's basically forcing us to realize that, you know, you know, we helped a lot of people become their regional yogurt producers. And, you know, we used to have a little bit of distribution outside of Vermont through Northeast co-ops and Stowe Mills, which all became United Natural Foods. And, uh, but now, you know, we help some people in Western Mass start a, a yogurt business, Side Hill Farm, and, you know, they're very, very popular in Mass, and now we don't sell much yogurt, you know, in Western Mass because they have their local brand. Same thing over here in Maine. But, um, you know, so our sales, you know, have, maybe they've contracted a little bit recently, and, uh, you know, it's kind of forcing us to sort of, you know, get into more supermarkets in Vermont and other, you know, and, you know, so we're still, we're still doing it. But I guess what I'm trying to say is that when you specialize in one product and get a license and get a federal license so that you can ship across state lines, it all of a sudden it really starts limiting you as to what you can do. And I think it puts a, cr it puts a crimp on your creativity too because you see, well, all I can really make is yogurt and what am I going to do? I'm going to make a couple different flavors or instead of like, well, maybe should I make curds or should I make, you know, a little bit of cheddar and, you know, but you're already geared up to do one thing and then you hire people to help you in your operation and they pretty much know how to do one thing and, you, you know, stores kind of start expecting you to do one thing and it really, what it does is it sort of backs you into a corner and then as time goes on, you know, you grow your sales and, you know, you think, well, once you get to million dollar a year mark, you're going to have died and gone to heaven. 
well, once you get to the million dollar year mark, I've said this a million times, and if you've heard it before, I'm sorry that I'm repeating myself, but you're in the same club with the 10 million dollar people, and they've all got CPAs and lawyers, and you don't, and so you're basically a minor league player playing in the major leagues, and you don't really have the expertise to, and you don't really care about it. You'd rather be out in your field, you know, moving a poly wire and giving your cows more grass or, or making hay or, or, you know, combining your wheat or something like that. But then you've got this other sort of thing hold it over your head. So, you know, and then you end up, the more, the more money you make or the bigger you get, the more you sort of come under the scrutiny of the powers that be. And um, what happens is, you know, all of a sudden somebody comes and the labor department says, you know, you need to get workman's comp for your employees. And, and you find out that the workman's comp on a farm is 20% of the, you know, the person's, which you're paying the person, which is a big chunk of money. You know, so, I mean, I feel really good that we have 10 or 12 people working for us and we try to pay top wages. But the cost of the insurance to, you know, um, and then if you use the insurance, you know, the auditor comes every year and goes over your stuff. Um, oh, you know, you, you gotta pay more and, and, and they'll charge you in advance for the next year by what you did last year. And you know, if you grow, I mean, yes, it, it works, but if you stay the same, but they're gonna add on, I don't, they're just, it's just so unfair, you know, and um, because the, the insurance company is a for-profit for business, and then you're mandated by the government to buy their services, and they, if you use their services, they're gonna charge you more. And um, so, I'm just at this point in my life where I'm saying, God, you know, be careful what you create, because <laughs> if it gets too big, um, all of a sudden, all the money that you used to put into rock phosphate now goes for something you can't even hold in your hand. It's a nebulous concept, like protection, you know, and it's, it's the same thing with property insurance, you know. You know, the Amish have got the right idea, you know, it's like if you have a disaster, the community gets together and helps you build a new barn, you know. And uh, I just, you know, I'm not going to quit. But, um, and then you start passing, you decide you want to pass your farm over to the next generation or, you know, and, you know, this is your baby that you created for 40 years and you're so passionate about it and you've been a pack rat and you've, so, you've saved all this stuff and then your son-in-law wants to start cleaning out the shed and he's throwing <laughs> away all this lumber that, you, you know, that's six feet long that you might be able to build something with it, you know, you never will because it's been sitting there for 20 years and, it, you know, we're going to burn it in the boiler and I'm like, oh, you can't do that. Yes, you can. <laughs> You know, and all my old pieces of equipment, you know, and you know, I, I saved all this stuff. You know what I mean? In the beginning, we really wanted to have like a, you know, you know the, you know the old barn cleaners that ran on the rail, you know, the track and stuff. You know, I've got all that stuff because we wanted to put it in. Well, I'm going to give it to Phoenix O'Brien here because he wants to do it. You know, he'll probably find out about ten years down the road that he's going to put a gutter cleaner in because it's a whole lot easier. But, you know, right now. You know, having a you know having a mirror track is a really good idea. So if anybody needs any old stuff, <laughs> come see me and we'll we'll give it to you. So, um, but you know, I, you can get really discouraged about all this stuff. But I think the one thing we do have to remember is that we have a community of you know people who want to make the earth better, who love farming, and we gotta all keep supporting each other and um, keep talking to each other, keep trying to be better every day, better ourselves, you know, share our knowledge with, with each other, share our mistakes, and um, proceed into the future, and try to change the world like one microbe at a time or something, you know, like really, you know, I, I believe that, um, you know, by taking care of the soil and, um, sequestering carbon in the soil by being really good farmers. Um, you know, that's how we're going to work on it. And in, in, in 40 short years, I mean, we've certainly seen 
Uh, I mean, I don't know if it's permanent or whatever, but it, it's a lot harder to grow crops now than it was 40 years ago. Um, maybe we have some hotter summers, but we have, you know, more, you know, in, in more, you know, more sort of erratic weather that kind of gets stuck in one way or another, either dry or wet, and it just, uh, and it's it's having a it's having a high organic matter soil that's going to really, uh, you know, get us through the dry times and the wet times. And the, and the other thing I'd like to say too is that you know I've had this you know fascination with growing crops and tilling the land and you know sort of going down the road of keeping our home farm you know 125 acres in total in total grass and not um, and not plowing it versus having this land that I've done a fair amount of plowing on I've grown cover crops on it too but our organic matter. On our home farm is eight to nine percent, and where we've been growing our grain crops, you know, with some cover crops and a little bit of rotation and a small amount of forages in the rotation, we haven't really increased our organic matter very, matter very much. It might be two percent, you know. And so what it's told me is that, you know, it's time for me to sort of tone down the grain growing and concentrate on the forages <coughs> and. Uh, you know, grow really, really high quality forages, you know, that are really mineralized, that can photosynthesize really efficiently, to take carbon dioxide out of here and put it down here as humus, you know, through root excavation. Um, that's, that's the future. So um, that's where we're going and, uh, you know, we hope it works for everybody. And uh, if you ever want to come visit us or need any help, you know, we're there to help you. So thank you very much. Thank you so much to Jacqueline. Great presentation. So we have a little bit of time to check out and we'll start on the short session.